Hello, occultists. Today I have a special guest joining me. I have Sacha, who is a Bruja, and I am going to try my best with my pronunciations today. She's also a professional palm reader, an astrologer, an extremely educated woman, a very fiery, ambitious woman. And I love that about you, Sacha. Thank um, you. Do you, want to say, yeah. do you want to say hello to everybody? Hi, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here with Ivy today. Um, and yeah, she said, come talk to me about brujeria. What is it? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> Yes. Well, I'll do the best I can to represent. I <laughs> love it. Yeah. So we're going to talk about brujeria. Did I do it right? Brujeria. And we're going to talk about a little bit about her palmistry as well um, with your practice, because I'm so curious to learn more about that. A little bit of astrology, talking about connecting to heritage. So we're going to talk about a lot of different things today. But just for the people who have no idea what this practice is about, can you start by giving us just a general idea of what brujeria actually is? Yeah. So brujería is the Spanish word for witchcraft. That's basically what it is. Um, so I'm a witch. And the only thing is that it's very different in, obviously I'm Latina. I am from Puerto Rico and in Puerto Rico, there are several, um, and, and this is very true for most of Latin America. There's a lot of, um, let me see if I can say this word, right? Syncretism. So it's a bunch of blended religions and, and not like borrowed. It's not like oh, we did this and we took this from this religion, but rather that we took different beliefs and we created a new system with different, like blending different elements from different religions. And so that's very common. So when we look at um, what we have available in Puerto Rico, we basically, we have Santeria, we have Espiritismo, we have um, Macumba, we have the indigenous who were the original um, people in Puerto Rico, the Taino, Arawaks, and the Caribs, um, they, and they were animist, okay? So we have the animism, and then the Catholics came in, which were the Spanish um, conquistadores, and they brought in their Catholicism, and then there's a lot of folk Catholicism, right? So, like, street Catholic. <laughs> it's like we, we kind of, and so when you blend those together, you get your own special spiritual sauce right yeah and it, it goes completely like aligned with our own special practice as well because if you ask or if you even get a book for like a kindergartner in puerto rico and it talks about the puerto rican heritage it's it, we teach although this is obviously factually incorrect but what kids learn like when they're five or six is that they are one third indio taino one third african one third spanish Right. Yes. And so that's the blend that makes up the, the Puerto Ricans and most of the Caribbean islands, the ones that were from Spanish um, conquistadores, because there was French and Dutch, too. And um, so that's what we learn, although obviously if you do a DNA test or 23andMe, it's going to be like 17, 20, 34, it's going to vary. But we just do a third, a third, a third. And um, and so when you look at those three, so you have the Catholic from the Spanish, you have the animism from the Tainos, and then you have the, um, from the Yoruba religion, you have the Santeria, right? And yes. the Orishas and stuff like that. So we combine all three and we have our own special sauce. Okay. That is so fun. Okay. Yes. It tell is. Me more. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Um, and then that is separate. And then that is separate from Brujeria, which Brujeria is, like I said, witchcraft, right? So being a bruja is not one of the main differences that I've seen from living here in the States. Now I've been in the um, Pacific Northwest for four years now is that here being a witch is a, an election. It's a path. It's a choice that people make and it, it's a practice, right? And that's cool because now I'm a bruja and I've chosen to be it since I moved here, but back home, um, you don't choose it, right? You basically have like, for example, in my case, my first um, dong, which is a gift, was palmistry. So they never call you a bruja. They call you, oh, the one that reads palms, la que lee mano, oh. or they, you know, or la astrologo, or la mano santa, a healer or la, la yerbolera, the one that works with herbs, or the one that, you know, so all these characteristics, um, like there's a lot of water scrying, obviously we're an island, so, you know, you can scry with river water, um, you can scry with ocean water, you can scry with fountain water, tap water, whatever. But there's a lot of water elements um, back home and um, 
and so one of the things is that oh like a like a lee la fuente the one that reads the fountain right but oh. you never have like they're they're not nobody's a witch because witch is bad right they're right. all just like dones they're all little gifts and it's like oh she's the one that um we also do shells a lot obviously an island again um so like the divination instead of being runes it would be like shells right so they're like oh ella lee caracol. she reads you know the shells and so those are different things and that that person can do those things but it doesn't mean that they're not a good catholic christian or something like that right they're not a bruja <laughs> wow i didn't realize that it was so that bruja was such a bad thing like mm -hmm. well i mean of course it makes sense with the heritage right because of the heritage so that's one thing that we have there and then like for example um and i mentioned this i think in my first or second episode in my podcast um my mom, she came to visit me over here and she's like, and who are you hanging out with? And I'm like, oh, I have this witch group. <laughs> and um, that, we have a Facebook group for local witches where I live. And I'm like, I like all my social activities are from that witch group. And she's like, that witch group. And she's like, how many people are in that group? And I'm like, oh, it's got like 1100 people in it. And she's like, oh, they can't all be witches. It's like, no oh. way. They can't all be witches. Like there can't be that many people in that section that have gifts because she's thinking, right? This is somebody that has to have some sort of gift. And I'm like, no, because here they chose to be witches. So they're choosing that as a path and they're choosing that as a spiritual practice. And she's yes. like, well, that's weird. <laughs> she's like, that's weird. I don't, I don't believe it. <laughs> Interesting. I had no idea that like palmistry was, so is that kind of your entryway into this? Like, so you were professional palm reader. That's your spiritual gift, so to speak. That's what kind of brought you in. I love that. Yeah. Okay. So the way that it started was um, I was 14 and there was like a school event. It wasn't a play, but it was like a school event where we had, it, it's called international night and each um, group like had a country to represent and they were going to be doing like crafts and arts and selling food and whatever from that country. And so my group, my classroom got like 10, um, got um, Spain. And they're like, oh, you know, so they had the flamenco dancers and the tapas and the, you know, and yeah. whatever, the paella. And they're like, oh, we need like a uh, gitana, a gypsy, right? Um, yeah. And so obviously that word, this was the 90s. So, you know, that's not the, the politically correct word anymore, but they're like, you know, you can see my hair, right? <laughs> and it was longer and my, and I, you know, I, my flow is like long flowy skirts and whatever. It's just my style. So they're like, oh, that's you. And I'm like, oh, sure. It was going to be like an act sort of thing, right? I'm like, like waving around a crystal little pendant or or using a crystal ball with fog or something. They're just like, just do whatever you want, right? Because that's what we're going to. And so my idea was to use a crystal ball. And one of the girls in the classroom was like, oh, I have a crystal ball. It's going to be great. And I was thinking, you know, like all these movies, like a big crystal ball. And we could put like um, um, dried ice underneath and make it look cool. And when she shows up, she showed up with something like this big. It was like a pendant. It was like for like a charm for like a necklace or something. And okay. I was like, I can't do anything with this. <laughs> you know? No, so I'm like, OK, plan B. I'll just read palms. And then, you know, first person that comes up, then I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I read palms and whatever. And I obviously, you know, in my get up and so forth. And I read the first palm. And that evening I read 81 palms. Oh and, my God. <laughs> yeah. Obviously I was sick and bedridden for like three days because I knew nothing about energy, about shielding, about, you know, taking on those, you know, so, and I was a kid, I was 14, you know, so that was the way that, um, my gifts came up. Right. And so it was just like, you know, the first one I read, she just left in tears, told everybody I was legit. And then after that, it and wow. uh, yeah. Okay. Um, coming from, we're a small island and we're a place where, I mean, we're 3 million people on the island, but it's still very, where are you from? Oh, I'm from such and such town. Oh, do you know such family? And then it's always related to the, the last names and who do they know and the connect and, you know, everybody has like an awareness of last, last names and towns and do you know so-and-so? And so I quickly became like, oh, so-and-so's daughter who reads palms right yes and they're, and they're like oh are you the, you know are you so-and-so's daughter or so-and-so's granddaughter and do you read and like everywhere i would go i would just end up reading palms and so wow. that happened for about five years and then in college i stopped because i had a boyfriend that basically he's like we're gonna break up because we never do anything and i'm oh. like oh, yeah because he's like i pick you up to go out 
we get somewhere and then you sit down, you read poems all night, and then I take you back home. <laughs> he was my yeah. Uber before Uber existed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I he's, love like, it. he's like, no, this is not fun. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, that, that's definitely not fun for him. <laughs> so I get it. Yeah. And so, and I mean, and I didn't charge because um, it's, it's seen as you don't charge for spiritual gifts. That's oh. something that I also appreciate from having moved here that I've learned how to charge. I still work like sliding scale and whatever, but um, I've learned like this, there's like an energy exchange, right? And, and so back home, you only accept like, um, like gifts, right? So somebody can bring like, you know, platanos or flowers or people give you gifts in exchange for something or they don't give you anything, but you are not supposed to charge because it's considered a gift from spirit and like, spirit is the one that's supposed to receive the honor not you and so like if you do charge then it's like you're like like being disrespectful to like those gifts that were given to you and so i was raised with that mentality which was you know it's it, it makes sense right that you know that totally the boy wouldn't want to hang out with me <laughs> we go to a party right yeah. yes definitely <laughs> and then we don't even have money to go buy an ice cream cone afterwards so it's like no 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 this is not working no <laughs> so <laughs> definitely not yeah and so um i stopped so i stopped doing palmistry altogether and that's okay. the only way that i could have any a little bit of like control was to be like oh no you know i i'm not reading palms anymore and so i basically stopped when i was starting college maybe my second year of college or so i'm like no i'm not reading palms anymore but i have all this you know intuition and all this um desire right and just natural inclination to connect and I studied, stu I started studying astrology. Okay. And then that one is a little more um, acceptable to like, make it like a profession. Okay. Because, you know, there's a couple of famous astrologers and so forth. And, you know, it's just, it's seen a little bit different. I don't know if it's seen a, like a little bit more sciencey, I guess, or, you know, like you have to study for it and you got to, and so that was like a little bit more acceptable. Um, but like, if you were like reading palms or if you were reading caracoles, like snails and stuff like that, those things, the people would expect you to basically, it's like a gift and you could accept it like donations or exchanges or stuff like that, but not like say, Hey, I charge so much for this. Right. Right. You, so you said reading snails. What is yeah, that? Caracoles shells, the shells. Oh, oh like seashells. Shells. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like seashells. Yeah. Caracoles. Yeah. Got it. So Definitely. yeah, people read the people um, back home. They read shells. They read coconut. And they read, um, they read the water. Those are the three main things that people do. Really? So they like crack open a coconut and then mm -hmm. read the, the meat on the inside or the something? Meat, the water, the lines, the grunt. Yeah. That is so cool. Okay. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyways. I don't do it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so I want to like dive into the palmistry stuff with you for sure. And I want to talk about, um, the astrology stuff too. Can you uh, tell me like, before we dive into all that, cause I want to go down a rabbit hole with that. Um, can you tell me like, as far as Brujeria is concerned, um, is there any like correlations with European witchcraft that you have seen? Like where are the differences, where are the similarities that you know of, at least if you're familiar with it? I mean, the first thing that I would say is that witches throughout time and through all spaces have been using the materials that they have available right and i think that those examples that i've given of reading like the coconut or the water are very good examples of that just like there are people you know in in other areas of the world that use you know the the weed or people that use the runes were little stones right and they had with their alphabet so people use what they have available and they've been using divination techniques they're, they're just tools, right? All these um, things are just tools for people to be able to use their intuition to be readers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the first thing. And so obviously it sounds really exotic because for me, you know, it's, it's all the, but back home, it's pretty typical, right? You can just grab a coconut and it's available and that's what you're going to be doing. Um, so I think that's probably one thing that's very similar. Their thing that's um, not similar would be like here they practice a lot like the wheel of the year and the different festivities because over there the temperature is the same basically throughout the year oh. so the seasons are not as marked so there's not that big difference in like we're changing the seasons you you know when harvest season is or when you know spring season is because obviously things are blossoming or growing but weather wise climate wise it's pretty much the same throughout the year 
and the changes are a lot more subtle. So that doesn't like come up as much. So like even the, like the shortening of the days that we have here or the long lengthening of the days, the difference isn't like right now, but in winter here, it gets dark like at four and now it gets dark like at nine, there's five or five and a half hours. Um, back home, the difference might be an hour, you know, because we're so close to the equator that the difference is nothing, you know, when right. part of the year is 6 p.m., part of the year is 7 p.m., that's it, you know? Yes. And um, so that's one of the things. Um, I think that another thing we do have, like I mentioned, we do have lots of um, animism, I think, is pretty much included throughout most witchcraft and the, the are elements that are coming from the from the, the Indian from the uh, Taino heritage, those are animist. And so that's pretty similar. And so is like sympathetic magic and stuff. And um, those would be very similar to witchcraft, brujeria. Um, and, and Santeria also has that practice. And then I think that the people that work with um, pantheons and gods and deities and stuff like that, there are similarities more with probably with Santeria because Santeria has like the God and then it has the Orishas, which are mortal spirits that intervene on behalf of the humans. And then it has the humans and then it has the ancestors and then it has the spirits of like animals and minerals and stuff like that. So their layout is, I think, more similar to what I've seen in witchcraft where we, we talk in witchcraft, like, you know, European witchcraft, they talk more about like the different pantheons, which are gods, but their, their gods are very similar to the Orishas in the sense that they're very mortal, right? They, they have jealousies, they have desires, they make mistakes, they can, you know, get mixed. They need, <laughs> um, they need to be honored and they need to be fed in order to grow in presence and importance, right? Mm -hmm. And they intervene, but it's a, you know, you honor me and then I'll, you help you get to, um, to guide you to get to your destiny or to your fate. Right. And so that I think is pretty similar in that sense. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So you, so I guess, can we deep dive into Santeria then? I sure. really want to know more about that because it sounds like, so correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like bru brujeria is more like folk magic where mm -hmm. you have all this, you know, heritage and traditions that have been passed down. And then Santeria sounds like it is more of a structured thing. So yes. you... And so the first thing I want to say is I'm not an initiate in Santeria. You can mm -hmm. tell because I'm not dressed in white. <laughs> um, and so you can tell I'm a bruja because I'm dressed in black, you know. And, um, but no, I'm not an initiate in Santeria. Santeria does, um, I guess you would call it a closed one because it does have a pathway that you need to take and you need to take like vows to be able to progress to a certain level and be accepted into the um, house, right? But it is so prevalent that many of the practices and I would say this is true for Puerto Rico, for Cuba, for Venezuela, for Guarianas, the North, the, you know, I'd say it's pretty prevalent, like everything that's like sort of Caribbean, like the top of South America, all the way to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, the practices there, because that's where all the slaves were coming in, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the practices there are pretty similar, right? And even if somebody isn't a Palo, a Macumba, or a Santero, everybody in, in the society knows about it. And everybody, like, for example, I'm not, I'm not an initiate in Santeria, but I do um, work with Yemaya, right? Oh, okay. And Yemaya is the Orisha of the ocean and she's considered the mother. She would be pretty similar to Hecate, right? Because she also um, controls, like, she, she works with witches. <laughs> so she would be very similar in that sense. And um, she's like the giver of life, right? And so in Santeria, which most of it comes from the, like, okay, so backtracking to colonial times. Spanish come down from Europe, they hit the Caribbean, right? The Caribbean sort of like an L shape. And then over here is like a U shape is Mexico. And then the top, all the way over here, the top of South America. And there's, all throughout the Caribbean, we have different um, different um, Indian um, tribes, the Caribs, where the name comes from, 
Arawaks were coming up from like Venezuela and they populated like the lower half of the Antilles and the Tainos are the three of the main ones, right? And they come in and, you know, they do their colonial thing and you know, they kill off people and, you know, they get the, and the people they don't want to kill off, they kill them anyways because they get them sick and so forth. Right. And then um, they kill off the guys first, they keep the women, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then about 20, 25 years later, it's not sustainable anymore and they can't enslave the Indians because, you know, they've either killed them off or they ran off. So they start bringing in slave trade. Okay. okay. And most of the slaves are coming in from the West of Africa, right? Because that's the closest to getting to the um, crossing the ocean. And that would be West Nigeria, Nigeria and um, Congo and Ben. Bentu and so the that kind of area like Puerto Rico most of them were from um, West Nigeria and then so all those slaves start coming up and there was a big slave um, trade especially like in Cuba where there's a lot of Santeria um, going on because once they arrive um, you know the Catholics they want to Christianize them save them so forth and for them with their religion it was easy for them and this is where i said that the syncretism comes in because and it, the key here is all those african slaves they yeah. come in with their religion and they meet the indians and the indians are animist and they have animist practice and they're like oh yeah i get that and they meet the catholics and the catholics have levels and they're like oh yeah i get that and so through them is the merge of those okay i love how you explain that that makes so much more sense to me now yes got yeah. it following right yeah and so um and then the catholics they don't you know they're they just want everything to be catholic but they don't really care <laughs> as long as it doesn't really become like uprising and stuff like that and the important thing is that the church gets its money and stuff like that so they also and they do the imposition the same thing that we've heard like you know the winter solstice becomes like christmas and all that so they do the same thing with the direct religions of the indians and the african slaves where they're like that one oh yeah 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 that's virgin mary that's the same thing this is in, in my language it's virgin mary and so you know <laughs> and then then that's what they do. And then that one, oh, that's the Virgen de Caridad. That, that, she, she protects the military. Oh, that's this one. Yeah, that's the same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So sure. that's, and that's what they do. So then there's that, you know, meshing of the religions where, like I said, it's not like we're adopting something. It's where that it actually becomes a whole new structure. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so if you were looking to look at the Catholic and the Santeria elements together, the Catholics, they have God, and in Santeria, they have God, which is Oludame, and then they have the intermediaries, the people in the middle, which would be the Orishas over here, which over here is angels, right? Angels yes, such yes. as St. Michael, you know, Josef, and all the different angels, and also the saints, right? Mm -hmm. But saints could be a little bit lower, though. But so they have the inter and those are the Orishas, and the Orishas over here, which is what the Santeros. Um, work with are these different and like I said if you would looked at it as the uh, European witchcraft it would be the pantheons right it would be the, the whole med pan god pantheons so it's yes. like their own god pantheon it's the African god pantheon basically and then you got the humans those are the same on both levels and then they have in Santeria you have Egun which are the ancestors right and then you have the spirits and the spirits are the, what's infused in the plants and in the animals. And yes. that's where they have the same elements as the Indians, because the Indians, what they were using were obviously the, the um, nature, right? Like the river and the waters and the rocks and certain, and the animals and, you know, the phenomenals, like, you know, the hurricane, like the word huracan, hurricane comes from the Taino language. And it was the God of like, it was their bad God, right? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And so he was like, oh, and usually it's Huracan comes in, he's in a bad mood and he's going to fight with um, Yukiyu, which is the God of the white clouds, which was at the top of our rainforest. And so, because our rainforest stands like in the middle and it takes the brunt of all the hurricane. And then that way, all the ocean towns are pretty much safe. So yes. when the Indians are living over here on the ocean towns and they look over there and there's the battle between the two gods. And so 
Huracan became a mainstream word and it comes from the Taino language. And it's like, for them, it was the God, like it was the evil God and that's coming to bring calamity. And it was just a hurricane, obviously, which yes, yes. It's still, a, it's still a terrible God. <laughs> oh my gosh. All this information is so incredible. And you, I mean, you teach too, right? Like we're, we're going to, for anybody watching this video, we are going to put her information down below. And I'll mention this towards the end of the video as well, because she teaches, she, you do so much stuff. Like yeah. you're so educated. I'm just listening to you in awe and I'm like, tell me more. <laughs> yeah. So, no, and awesome. so, yeah. So that's the way. And I mean, like, so things that, um, another thing that would come like from Santeria, that would be similar to maybe like in witchcraft and so it's a permanent practice is their concept of ashe which is just basically everything that's like the divine it's mm. it's the divine it's everything that's like the cosmic divine the and universal cosmic energy yeah so when they say oh, ashe then they're wishing you the like the divine cosmic energy to move you to work with you to flow for you you know and so Whenever you go to any sort of culture, you're going to see that the elements are the same. Yeah. Um, probably because it's the truth. And we just have different explanations and different names for it and different manifestations. Yep. I agree. I've noticed that as well, looking at different cultures, that there is like the central theme and then you just have different ways of getting there, you know, different materials around you, depending on your environment. So definitely makes sense. Um, I wanted to ask you as well, because you're living in the United States now, how do you remain connected to your heritage? So let's bridge into that a little bit. Like, are there things that you do that help you stay connected? So I think that um, there, there has to be an intentionality in keeping alive your connection with your land, with your ancestors, with everything that has to do with your culture. It's very easy to get caught up in, you know, in the nostalgia and then just looking at it as, obviously I look at it, you know, if you look at the diaspora, it's more focused usually on politics and helping their country from afar and going back and vacationing, right? Yes. But when you bring it into your daily life, how do you do that? Well, you have to do that through the oral traditions. Oral traditions still remain to this date the most important weight in spirit, in my opinion, of being able to transmit who somebody is. So yes. you need to share your oral traditions with your with your people, with your siblings, with your children, with your, you know, loved ones. And that's really important. I think that's something that everybody should do. And you need to share those oral traditions in order, because the, the brain and the spirit, um, the heart, you know, it just touches it different than reading up on it. You know, it, yeah. it, it's a different impact. So sharing traditional, um, using your language, um, keeping the language alive is, you know, really important. Um, obviously, we're using Spanish because we've been colonized for 500 plus years. There is the in the Taino dialects, but there's a lot of um, internal dispute on like, how is it spoken? How is it not spoken? Is that the correct meaning? There's some, you know, a couple hundred words that might be not even probably like 100 or so that are like, okay, yeah, this is what it means. But the, um, the structure of how it was used and so forth isn't like it's kind of debated. Mm. But I think that, you know, because some people get so focused, some linguists get so focused, like on the small things. Yeah. And I think that any of the efforts that are put forth, everybody understands that they're not going to be pure because it's a language that, you know, has died out. So it's just like appreciating that work and that deep dive into it and being able to incorporate maybe the symbols in your sigils or in, you know, your art or whatever you're doing, because it helps keep it alive. Yes. I personally think that we should always have a little bit of your earth with you. So sand vial or earth vial or, you know, plantain or whatever. Um, I have a whole water altar where Jemaja lives and that has sand from Puerto Rico and it has caracoles, um, not snails. What was the word? Shells, Shells. from Puerto Rico. <laughs> yeah. and, then, um, and it has, yeah, the, I'm thinking what else does it have from Puerto Rico? It has, oh, we use, um, I don't know what that's called. It has little bowls that are made from gourds, gourd, gourd. There gourd. is gourd. There's like a gourd, gourd is like a pumpkin thing, kind of. Yeah, so from our local ones. And so then you dry them out and then they become bowls. So yes. all my bowls, like from my offering bowls are made from that. Really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. 
Yeah. Can, so side note then, can we talk about your pumpkin? We don't have to talk about your pumpkin if you don't want to, but it's so it's interesting. Little... Hang on. Yeah. Cause it's, it's so interesting how you do. And this is something that you do you every see it right here. Where is it? Right there. Like where the little pulsar is. Can you see? Uh, oh, I can see it. A, let me move away. There you yep. Go. It's down below in that pot, in that, in that pot, pot right you behind you. Right there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So tell us about that pumpkin. Tell us what you do. Cause I think that was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a prosperity spell that I have. Um, it is in honor of one of the Orishas. Um, and Oshun. And so it is a pumpkin because she loved pumpkins and it has um, honey on top and glitter. And when you prepare it, you prepare it thinking of like the honey, like it being sweet and being attractive and bringing in all the um, currencies that are represented by the glitter. And so I use both silver and gold glitter um so you prepare the come the pumpkin you well you you get a pumpkin you consecrate it for the purpose you tell it what you're using it for and then you bless it you can sprinkle it with holy water or florida water if you want you can sprinkle it with that then you pour the honey on top you need to drink take some of the honey so that the orisha knows that it's in good faith and that it's not um poisoned oh, because okay. you're taking it too and then you put the glitter on top and the glitter, I put glitter, gold glitter, silver glitter, and gold flakes. I put all three. And then when you're putting them on, I personally think of specific currencies or monies. Like I want this to be bountiful. I want this to come in. I want this money that's owed to me to come in. And I want it for my benefit, my family's benefit, for the benefit of the, the people that depend on me, economic, um, you know, my employees, my suppliers, the people that I'm going to contract. And also you make a pledge of how much you're going to like donate, you know, and for the benefit of like being able to help so-and-so. And so you're doing all that while you're preparing the pumpkin, right? Yeah. And then you set it. And then once you set it, you just leave it. And I leave it usually, last. I try to do it on the new moon in earth signs because earth is like when it grows and the new moon so it starts growing and it lasts about those three months right yes um and when you're finished with it you have to take it to a river and because she's the river uh, she's the goddess of the rivers and you have to take it to the river and you have to thank it for your its service been doing yes. it for 12 14 years or so I love it. Oh my gosh. When you show me that, I and I haven't, it. I haven't been broke yet. <laughs> so it's been working. Nice. Know? I love yeah. it. Okay. So let's, let's dive deeper into your palmistry stuff, because I want to go back to that. Palmistry is like when you first exposed me to that, cause you are the person that really kind of exposed me to how complex palmistry actually is. I always like, was like, Oh, I really want to learn palmistry. It seems really interesting. And then she recommended me a book. Um, and I read it and I was like, Oh my, <laughs> she also taught us some of the palmistry as well in our, in our study group that we have. So, um, do you want to kind of just give us a little brief of like, what are the things that you look at when you are doing a palm reading for the first time? So the first thing I look at is the shape of the hand. Um, most people think that the palm, so palmistry, when palmistry started, the first people that were practicing it were actually medical professionals, right? Mm -hmm. Or would have been, would have been the local doctors because, um, and if you think about it, when you go to your practitioner, they still look at your nails, they still look at um, the color of the palm. So there's still some elements that have survived and still make it into like modern medicine, right? Um, but the palm, the original palmists were people that were um, practicing medicine and they were looking at the physical aspects of the nails and the colors, but also like the history and the mercury line and so forth. So the first thing that um, I look at is the shape of the hands. The shape of the hands will tell you you can divide it. Some people divide, have some sort of name. Some people, I like the, the, it's easier for me to just go with the theory of like the fire hand, the water hand, the air hand, and the earth hand. It's just an easier subdivision. Um, and some, and there's others that call it like the psychic and the mental and the elemental and whatever, but it's about the same thing. So you look at the hand and you're basically checking to see if the person has a long hand, a short hand, a rectangular or a square hand. And then you look at the fingers, you want to see um, if the fingers are short or long. And in comparison to the palm, if you can see my fingers are long, but they're short in comparison to my palm. 
So that's a fire hand, right? So then you ascribe all the elements that you would like in astrology to fire personalities, you ascribe that to a fire hand. And then if my fingers were long and my palm were long, then that would be a water hand. So you ascribe the same things as a water personality. And if my fingers were short and my palm were short, that would be earth. And if my fingers were long, but my palm were short, it would be air. Right? Yes. Yes. So that's the first thing that you look at is the shape of the hand. And then you ascribe the characteristics. If you know astrology, you use those um, um, elements. If you don't, then just kind of think of water, you know, flowing emotions. If you think of, um, you know, earth and like more practical and so forth and like rooting around and making things grow and stuff. And then um, the next thing that you look at are the tips of the fingers. And then some people have, I think in my case, I, all my tips are the same. They're all like rounded conical. So, okay. but some people have, put yours up. Let me see them. Can you see them? I, I, think, so. I think yours are all conical. You have a little bit of square on this one on the ring finger. Of okay. Your, is, that, is that your right hand? Yes. No, this is my left hand. Left hand. Yeah. So yeah. you have yeah. a little, if you look at the tip of that one, it looks a little bit square. Oh, right. okay. Interesting. Yeah. Got and, it. Yeah. Looking at it. Yeah, it does. So you look at them and then, so you want to see if they're rounded, if they're square, if they are conical, which would be sort of triangular, or if they are um, spatula, which look like little frog fingers tips. What does that look like? Spatula? What? Let me see if I, I, uh, the rock. I love the rock. The rock has spatula fingertips. So they look what? like really, yeah. Um, yeah, we need to know more about spatula fingers. Yeah, so, so they're original thinkers, actually. So it's a really, it's a, it's good. It's usually a good um, indication. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then each finger has a meaning. Yes. And so, and controls an area. So this one here has will and determination, the thumb. There are some people that only read thumbs because you can get so much information off thumb. Wow. Wow comparing the it has all three but you know comparing the two sections on the upper um the length how they are if it if, how you hold it if you hold it far away close up close in um all those things are considered um how flexible it is you know so the thumb is will and logic and determination and then considering the third section which is actually the first mount which is the mount of venus love as well okay this finger is all about your outer persona. So like it includes work, it includes leadership, it includes your roles in society, all those fingers. This one is all about fate. It's about who you are. Of course, this is who I am, right? <laughs> and, um, and also like organization and how you see yourself. So self-confidence is there too. Then this one is, and this is why we put rings on it when we get married, is about love and relationships. It also includes um, harmony and harmony includes music. So, and friendships. So those are all there. And then this one is communication. Um, it has math. It has um, communication, sex, math, or basically the th three things you can see there. And then when you go to its line, you also see health. Okay. Yes. So each finger has its meaning. So one of the first things that you look at in when you're looking at the tips, you'll see what, so like a rounded one is more sensitive and more, you know, like flowy and you feel affected by your emotions. So then that's like the general, right? Aspect of this person, if they have all tips like that. But if let's say they have a square in their relationship finger, then you say, oh, you approach relationships with a more practical view. Mm. Okay. Because you know that, and they're trying to be more practical in who they're surrounding themselves with in what balances and how they're exposing themselves to other people and who they're bringing into their life. They're trying to be more practical about that. Right. Okay. okay. And then, then if you, they have like a triangle one, those are more mystical psychic. And so they might, I hardly ever see like all 10 fingers with that, but they might have it in, let's say they have it on this finger. And then you're like, oh, you're really good at reading people and reading the room. And you have like an uncanny sense for things that are going to happen externally because that's the finger it's affecting. Right. Yes. And then the spatula ones is creativity and originality. So if the person has let's say the creativity, let's say in their pinky, then you're like, oh, you're a really creative, innovative sort of communicator, 
right? Because it yes. has to do about communication. So I never is. thought that you would have like different tips on each fingers. Cause look yeah. to a novice, like I'm like, oh, they're just round. They're all round, but really mm-hmm. they all do have different shapes. So. Yeah, they do have shape. And, and ours don't have that much. Like I've seen people that have like two or three different, usually people have about two on their hands between yeah. all four. Cause it's like where your, your personality type is. Right. But some people have, I've seen up to, I think three different types of tips. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Yes. And then, so that's tips, finger shape. And then, like I said, what the fingers are. Then the next thing that you look at is the relationship between what we call the three worlds. So the first world is everything from the tip of the fingers to the base of the fingers where they fold. Then the second world is from the base of the the fingers to where the thumb joins the world, the hand. So that's the second world. And then the third one is from the thumb joint all the way down to the um, bracelets. These are called the bracelets, the ones that are the first lines on the wrist. Okay. These, those are called yes. bracelets. That's where the name comes from. from jewelry it comes from the what? bracelets. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so um, then you look at those three, those are called the three worlds. The top one is the mental world. The middle one is the practical world. And the third one is the central world. Mm-hmm. And you look at those three and you see which one's the largest one, because that will be the, na- the person's natural inclination. So if their fingers are way longer than the rest of the other two, then they're a person that's up in their head all the time. They're mental. They like to study. They like to learn. They, they, they like to analyze things and they don't like to respond quickly. They want to get information, be able to judge it and, you know, let it sit in them and then they'll make decisions. Mm -hmm. If a person's middle is larger, they're probably really good at getting things done they're more practical, they're business oriented, they can network, they can, you know, have a lot of success in finance and stuff like that, because they're, they're focused on like what's happening in like earth. Right. Yes. And then if it's the bottom one, it's the sensual and sensual isn't like sex. It's actually like the senses, right? So beauty and, um, luxury and like having a good eye for things and relationships as well. Um, not like how their relationship is going to go, but like seeing like, like a matchmaker would have probably a big, good, you know, cause they would see like how people fit together. Right. Um, and just like a designer or a musician, you would expect that a chef because they like food and they like the, the pleasure of food. You would expect them to have nice, nice, chunky third world. Right. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's the next section. And then after that, you look at the mounts and the mounts are basically they correlate with each of the fingers, except this one, which is the Venus one, not the, like the thumb one. Um, so what you have underneath the pad that you have underneath this finger would be the Mount of Jupiter, because this is the Jupiter finger. Yes. If you had the one underneath here would be the Mount of Saturn. If you had this one here would be the Apollo Mount. This one would be the Mercury Mount. And then Mars is here and here, inner and outer. And this is called the plane, but the plane is difficult to read because there's already lines in between. Then you have the moon and then over here I do the Pluto and then this is Venus. Okay. So I like it because I've been able to correlate. really, you know, after I learned astrology, it, it helped a lot because the mounds, they have similar expressions or areas of control as does astrology. So that's really cool. And then after the mounds, then you actually go to the lines. <laughs> we've done a bunch and we've never even touched the, and oh, and, um, I also look at the correlation of the fingers. So I look how, look, you see this one's separate from the other ones and this one's separate. So this is a a natural, like, you know, so my communication, it's hard for the person since it's separate, it's hard for them maybe to communicate with their loved ones because this is the partner and the friends, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a separation in their communication from their friendships. And then, so you see the relationship between the fingers and then the you see the, the friendship one, the relationship one and the middle finger, like lean toward each other. Right. Yeah. So then you would be like, Oh, you know, like you depend on the feedback from your loved ones, from your friends to prop you up for your own self-confidence. Right. So they really need that small nurtured group. So that's something else I do that. I do that more at the beginning, like looking at the relationship of the fingers between themselves. You also look at how the length, because like there's supposed there's, higher set, lower set joints. 
So you have to see if the joints, mine are all regular. Some people might have like a higher set pinky might look like, you know, naturally the hand goes like this and then the pinky goes down a little bit, like a quarter inch, but some people might have it like almost at the same place as the other fingers. That would be a high set pinky. That's a risk taker, a daredevil or a motorcycle rider kind of thing. Lower set, this is normal. And then like really low, it'd be the opposite. They'd be like really afraid to do things, right? Same thing with the thumb. And there's a point where you expect the thumb to be. Mine's normal. It gets to about halfway through the first, right? But some people have a higher set and it might get like up to here. They're like, they believe themselves to be the shit. <laughs> and then they're like, I'm the, you know, and then it's because I'm the most intelligent. This would be Sheldon, you know, from Big Bang. You right, probably, right. Yeah, like, <laughs> obviously I'm the most intelligent person alive, you know? That obviously. Kind of <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then like lower set would be, or like out would be, you know, like they, they can't make sense of their own life. Like it just depends. So you look at where their fingers are set. Um, and then, then I think we've covered most of the things. Then you get actually to, oh, then, then there's the texture. So you touch the texture of the hand. Mm -hmm. um, so when I do virtual reads, obviously the texture, I can't do it. Um, I can't feel the heat or if it's cold and you've checked like if fingers are cold or if they're uh, hot or if they're only cold in certain places, that means that that area they're trying to be detached and logical. And then the rest of the hand is warm. Um, you look at the redness or the yellowness or anything like that, which is more medical as well. Um, and then the texture, if it feels soft, if it feels sweaty, if it feels clammy, if it feels rough, if it feels bouncy, all those have different meanings. Okay. Wow. And then after that, we get to the palm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so it's really, it's really chiromancy, which chiromancy is the study of the hand. Cause yes. it's really chiromancy palm mystery is just this, right? Yes. But I do chiromancy really. And then, um, then you get to the palm and the palm has six major lines. Most people show about four of them. You can have people only show two lines. You can have people show all six, but on average, people show four of them. Um, the three main ones are the curved one, which curves around the Mount of Venus, which is the, um, lifeline. It doesn't tell you how long you're going to live. It tells you about your energy, your vitality. It can tell you about incidents like head traumas or isolation periods and stuff like that. Um, I use it a lot to read about childhood as well, because depression comes in like sideways here. Anxiety comes in like little upward lines, childhood traumas come in over here. So there's just lots that can be read in this section here. Mm. And then if their lifeline is affected by any of the things that are happening in the Mount of Venus, then obviously you know how that may affect, or you can see constant like lines, or it could be like an autoimmune disease or something like that. It's something that's there the whole time and it's affecting them, right? Yeah. Then they have the headline, which is the middle one. And there again, there we're looking at how long it is, how deep it is, and if it curves or if it's straight. And if it curves or if it's straight, gives you an idea if the person's more practical or if they're more creative, mm. right? And where it curves to also gives you an um, indication of their interest. Because if it goes straight across and it goes to the Mars, they're more interested in things that are happening. If it curves down, it goes towards their Luna, they're more interested in intuition, right? So it just depends on where it's, if it goes boom, straight down over here, they're interested like in heritage and stuff like that. So it just depends on where it goes. And then the heart line is the third one up here. Same thing. You're also looking to see if it's curved or if it's straight to see if a person's more romantic or more um, practical. And so you're looking at that. And those are the three main lines that people like see. Then there's the Saturn line, which is this one here. Okay. It goes straight up from the middle of the palm, like where you would take your pulse. And it goes all the way straight up to right the middle finger. And then some people have it all the way. Some people don't have it all the way. And depending on how far up it goes, you can read how long they plan on. So fate and work aren't always related, but often they are. So because some people, you know, they define what they're working and it's part of their self-identity. So it does come up. Some people just have a job and it has nothing to do with their personality and it's not what their purpose is, but it, it's, you know, usually it's merged or you can kind of see it. And so one of the things is you see how long they're going to be working. Right. Mm. And then the Apollo line is the fifth line. Not everybody has an Apollo line. 
I have an Apollo line. Um, it's right under this finger, right? Mm -hmm. You can see it. This one. Yep. yep, I can see that. And so, but it, if you look at my hand like this, normally you don't really see it. It's not as marked. It's not as deep. And so one thing that you can see is your lines, some days they're just more active than other days, right? They're awake, they're red, they're like, hey, I'm here, pay attention to me kind of thing, right? Yeah. And so those are days that's like, pay attention to this sort of theme, pay attention to what's going on right now, right? Yes. And then, um, and then the sixth line, I really don't have it, you might have it maybe because you worked in healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. is the mercury line, which would come in like here, diagonally up towards this pinky. I don't know. I don't, I don't, my lines are not very deep. Okay. Open it up instead. Chapatra, go a little further back. Yeah. From here. Yeah. I can see it. It's not very deep, but it's coming. It's the one that's more. Yeah. Do the riverbed thing. Do this technique. Like that. Yeah. I'm getting more your Apollo line. Oh, but yeah, <laughs> but it's basically. A die, it's basically like a triangle. It goes like a triangle. It goes like from here to your Saturn line, usually. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Okay. And that's the Mercury line. And so, Mercury line, if somebody has it really marked on their hand, they might be working in health or be a healer or anything. There's a healer mark over here, which is three little lines on the top of here. Mm -hmm. um, but if somebody that doesn't have an active Mercury line and suddenly it blows up, it's like health related. It's like you're having a health problem right now. It's aggravated. Go look at yourself, right? Wow. So those are the main six lines. And then all the other lines are um, interceptions, things that are happening, blockages that are happening to those lines and whatever that line relates to and at a certain time because you can measure time on the Hans as well. Yes. So, yeah. And then there's, you know, dots, stars, islands, crosses, squares, <laughs> and all those um, groups grids those are all those all have a meaning as well yes so much more complex than i ever ever thought when you first exposed me to this i was like what and i i had already spent a couple of years studying astrology so at that point i was like i need a break from super <laughs> sciencey practices i'm like i cannot study another system as complex as astrology and palmistry i feel like is it's I very think astrology is is more complex than palmistry because I mean, palmistry after you've learned it, you got it, you know, yeah. um, it doesn't like astrology is so deep and there's so many, you know, it's, it's like never ending. I've been studying astrology for what, 25 years or so. And I feel like I'm not a novice, but I'm not like an expert. I'm like, right. Exactly. Mid <laughs> I'm mid advanced, you know, that's how I feel with my astrology practice as well. Every time I uncover something new, I'm like, are you serious? I feel like I'm back at the beginning. So yeah. yeah. And that's we probably won't have time to deep dive into astrology today, but, but if anybody wants to get in contact with her for a reading for palmistry or with astrology, um, maybe that's another video that we can do in the future at some point talking about astrology. I think that would be really fun or even just, you know, zoning in on natal astrology and not just astrology as a whole right, it's a because it's so big yeah right it's so big there's so many different systems and ways to use it so um but yeah oh my gosh <laughs> so is there anything else that you wanted to say on the topics that we discussed that maybe we didn't cover i'm pretty sure that all the information that you gave is just like my mind's blown right now and i'm sure everybody awesome. watching <laughs> like oh my gosh this is so cool so yeah no i think that um yeah we're good i think it's it's really important to be able to identify yourself and within like the practices that you feel comfortable yes. and not, I think I, I see so many people that doubt themselves or they doubt that they have the right to practice something. And, you know, I'm not going to like, obviously like uh, Santeria, right. I know I'm not in a shit. I can't say I'm a Santera because I'm not, I haven't gone through the whole year and I haven't gotten into the priesthood or anything like that. And I don't belong to a house. Um, but I know enough about it to respect it and to take from it the things that are culturally appropriate for me to take from, right? Because like I said, it's like a practice, like everybody wishes everybody well in a shy and everybody speaks. So when they're like, you hear songs or music or anything that people talk about the different saints and, you know, understanding those correlations. So I think like, don't doubt yourself. It's not like you're going to go and like, oh, now I just decided I wanted to do this. No. Um, but like things that do belong to your heritage, mm. you have a right to explore them, right? And just because you're like in the diaspora or you're 
a second generation doesn't mean that you don't have a gen. It actually would make it stronger and it would make your connection to your ancestors and to your own inner talents through whatever's running through your blood stronger if you start to feed into that knowledge. And that includes historical knowledge and language knowledge and cultural knowledge and, you know, all those different aspects come in and they're all elements that may seem like from daily life, but they really do contribute to the spiritual aspect as well. Yes. I think that's, yeah, my mind redundant. Love that. That's yeah. so beautiful. Thank you so much, Sacha, for coming on and talking to us about all this stuff. Well, um, thank you for maybe, having me. Yes. I, I do have, um, I do want to plug the podcast. Oh my gosh, we didn't even talk about your podcast. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you want to tell the audience a little bit about your podcast? No, sure. It's just, um, I have a podcast that's called The Brujas Broadcast. And I do it with another um, Latina um, witch that's living here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, her family is Mexican and she's a curandera. So she works with like the herbs and she also works with, um, what's this called? Hypnosis. She's a hypnotherapist. And then, so we balance each other very well. Cause I don't do like some conscious work or plants. I mean, it's a miracle. I have plants, but these, I always say that these plants, um, I'm not a garden witch at all. You know, I have all these plants, you see them all over. <laughs> it's just that they chose to live here. And that's why they're here, but it's not that I am a garden witch and I'm propagating or making them live. No, they chose to live here and that's why they've survived. I love but, it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I am not a garden witch at all. So we complement each other very well because I do all the cosmic and, you know, the divination and the astrology kind of thing. And she does all the earthy stuff. And, and then we're merging together, like everything that has to do with our traditions and how um, people can learn about brujeria and also how brujas can still continue, you know, practicing without maybe having all the elements and not having like the local botanica there to back them up and how they can incorporate all those things into their daily practice. Yes. Oh, I love it. And I've listened to the podcast. So everybody watching this, you need to check it out. It's so good because it has each episode has like a little bit of everything. You have one main topic that you're talking about, mm -hmm. but then you have the astrology stuff that you throw in at the end. She has like the herbalism stuff that she throws in at the end. And it's just a nice collection of stuff. I listen to it um, every single week. So oh, thank you. I love it. Yeah, no, it's really, cool. really good. So. Yeah, that's it. And then I'm um, Brujeria 101, just like it's written there. That's my webpage. And it's also how you find me on Insta and Facebook, which are the two that I'm on right now. I'm old, so I don't have TikTok <laughs> <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> or Snap or whatever is the new stuff. I don't have those. No. Um, but yeah, but on the social media, like, you can find me as Brujeria 101. Yeah. Awesome. And thank you so much, Sasha. Yeah. Thank you I for love having you. me, Abby. Yes. And thank you so much for watching this video. Um, again, I'm going to have all of our stuff linked below. I hope you have a blessed day and we will see you in a video or I will see you in a video very soon. Bye.